From Relay FM, this is Upgrade, episode 506. Today's show is brought to you by Sanebox, Uni Pizza Ovens, and Express VPN. It is April 1st, 2024. We're no fools. My name is Mike Hurley. I'm joined by Jason Snow. Hi, Jason. It's great to be here, Mike. It's great Not to be April here Fools. on the worst day of the year. <laughs> the worst day. I, I, this morning, I just turned to Lauren in bed while we were uh, like having our tea, and I said, Oh, by the way, it's April 1st. Don't believe anything today. She's yep. like, okay, great. And then there's an ug, like ug. Oh, yeah. boy. Yeah, great. It can Everything be we say well. here just is real. I-, I like it when people just have fun. They're yeah, not fun. Like, trying to trick you. That's, no. you know, I'm not into that. No, it- it's a great day for funny bits, right? Funny well, bits are fun. Aren't, though, be that's funny. That's the problem. You can really, well, really yeah, it is, it is also a day for people who aren't funny to try to be funny, and those don't work out so well. But fake, and- fake stuff is not- is my least favorite. I have a snow talk question for you. Okay. It comes from Levan, who asks, have you tried reading comics on your Vision Pro? I see that the Marvel Unlimited app works in compatibility mode. Honestly, my I, I don't view Vision Pro as a reading device. Mm. I will mm. read things in it, but mm-hmm. that's just not how I, how I use it. I haven't tried comics. Mm-hmm. I guess I will, but I just even my I just have no enthusiasm for it. Like I'm enthusiastic about immersive video and about 3D movies and even about just watching like a baseball game like I did last week. Like there are lots of things about it that uh, I, I'm interested in reading. I feel like I've got better devices. Like if I want to read a book, I've got a better device. It's my Kobo. If I want to read a comic book, uh, I've got a better device. It's my iPad Pro. Mm-hmm. And um and I, I think I just prefer that. Now, I have scrolled articles, but even like longer articles, I don't really want to read them on the Vision Pro. I'd really rather rather read them somewhere else. Yeah. So um, I have been reading this. So this is one of those cases where I just kind of take the question and totally turn it sideways. That's fine. Um, I have an answer, so we can come back around. Okay. But here, here it is. I have been reading um, the Amazing Spider-Man comic that you recommended mm. to me. That was an Upgrade Plus. So yeah, an upgrade, upgrade plus, plus made a good recommendation for Jason, I think. I hope. Nick Spencer's Amazing Spider-Man run. Yeah. And I've been reading that and enjoying it. I, I, I have come to realize, and I think Marvel has done this too. When I was reading comics the first time, and then certainly the second time I really got into reading comics when the iPad came out, I the struggle is something that I think they call it the eternal present in comics, but it's this idea that every comic that's ever existed, there's actually a great book called All of the Marvels about this, Hmm. where a guy decided to read every Marvel comic in the Marvel universe in order from start to finish and, and tell it like tell the story because it's meant to all have happened. And the problem with that is that first off, it's way too much. It's like how the TV show MASH, if you do a timeline of everything that happens in the TV show MASH, it's literally impossible for it to have happened during the Korean War. The Korean War was too short for MASH. Um, It's a little like that, where like Peter Parker, even if he's like in his 30s and married to Mary Jane Watson, Peter Parker is has lived too much and there've been too many lives and too many things have come and gone. And it's this eternal present also where Peter Parker today is in the 2020s. Um, and he remembers events that happened to him a couple of years ago, but when those events actually happened, it was the 1970s. And you're like, well, how does it all mean? It doesn't make any sense. This is a long way of saying that one of the things that I appreciated in reading these first few Nick Spencer, Spider-Man uh, comics is I feel like Marvel philosophically has gotten over the, and maybe DC has too, I don't know, but like gotten over the whole idea that like, it, that it makes sense. I feel like I didn't even mention like the, the other problem is if you try to do a, a, essentially a reboot and say, Oh, well, but he's actually back in school now or, Oh, he and Mary Jane weren't actually married. And you try to make him younger again. Mm-hmm. So he get, he like gets into his thirties and then suddenly he's in his early twenties again, yep. but everything happened, which doesn't make any sense. Right? So the Nick Spencer Spider-Man, it sets him in a certain age. Recent events are remembered. Distant past events are vaguely remembered. But I feel like it gets over the hump of like, it's good enough, right? Like, like you get it, you get it, mm-hmm. you get who this is. We're just telling some Spider-Man stories here, and and that's all that matters. Which is great because you know the burden of trying to make everything connect and make sense, which is impossible anyway, makes for worse storytelling. So I felt a freedom of like just saying, look, this is what this book is about. Is he's you know he's back with Mary Jane, and he's 
uh, unemployed for a different reason, um, and like, and just like get over it. And it's like I liked I liked that about it. I really appreciated that I could just dive in and and accept the premise of what this Spider Man story was trying to do, and then just go with it. So yeah, that was and fun. he, you know, the, the, as the series goes on, more things come up from the past. But I think he does a very good job of just picking what's necessary. Yeah, and um, you just have to. Except, I mean, yeah. I, I just, I find that the, but what about this? And didn't he already meet this person in this and all that? It's like, I just am over it now. I just, mm-hmm. I just want, just tell some good stories. Like, that's all that, that's all that matters. Well, I think they're getting so you, ready you, to, to reboot everything again, right? They're doing a, a ultimate, new ultimate stuff. That's fine. Whatever. That's about. There's going to be a new ultimate Spider-Man. It's like, I think it's already started, but it's, it's on Marvel Unlimited in a couple of weeks. Uh, so uh, yeah, I have tried the Marvel Unlimited app on Vision Pro it doesn't work for me. the The issue is, you end up with like this huge comic page in front of you, and you, it's too much head movement to get through the comic. Um, what I didn't try, and what might be nice, is if you are somebody who likes the, you know, the Marvel Unlimited app, same as the Comicsology app before it, does the thing where it zooms into each area. Oh. That you know, I know that some people like that, and I, maybe reading it like that it would be pretty nice, but. I mean, you'd probably be tapping quite a lot, but no, I, I like the full page. Just read the full yes. page. Okay. Um, and, you know, it is kind of cool that the Vision Pro has the, you can switch from landscape to portrait. Like, that's actually really nice for when you're reading a comic because uh, you don't actually have to physically move the iPad around. You can just, like, look at the button. Um, it's, it, was, it is a good experience. It is just not what I would particularly want. But what I'm happy about what Marvel did here is they were just like, screw it. We're just going to make it available because i think that that is what a lot more apps should be i think to just be like ah, oh, we'll just put it out you know like we're just gonna yeah. put it up or just do it just, you can use it if you want to and if you like it great i really wish yeah. more people would have done that if you would like to send in a snell talk question of your own to help us open a future episode of the show just go to upgradefeedback.com and send in your own snell talk question i have a I'm a follow-up for you, Jason. You remember a while okay. ago we spoke about there was a rumor that the Apple stores were going to start uh, br- we're going to bring this new technology in where they would be able to update the phones in the boxes. Right. Images of this machine have appeared online, so I have a link here from Mac Rumors. So this device it is built to allow for this perfect placement. So you take the iPhone boxes and you put them in, and the machine lights up. Once it detects the machine, once the machine detects that there's an iPhone, it is able to remo- remotely boot up the iPhone while the iPhone is still sealed in the box. Update the software and turn it off. It takes about 15 to 30 minutes for a phone update to complete. The device in the image looks like it can take six phones at a time and there are multiple devices stacked on top of each other. So like my thinking on this is this is quite an interesting idea, but for the main time that this is Im- most important, which is around iPhone launch time, this feels wholly impossible as a thing to achieve before from when the phones arrive to when people will be taking them out of the store. Mm-hmm. Right? It feels to me like this is an interesting idea, but that needs to be much, much faster than that time period or be able to take way more of these things. You know what I mean? Like half an hour per iPhone feels like a lot. Yeah, it it's true. I, I wonder what the volume is and how many of these machines they're making and all of that. And, you know, I think that this is, it's going to be limited to like certain models that are, that have an older version of software. Maybe it's it's less for the launch iPhones and it's more for like the ongoing stock so that when you hand out an iPhone to somebody in March, it's not all the mm-hmm. way back mm-hmm. on you know the one when it was manufactured in in uh, December or whatever. I don't know you know depending on the stock in the store. I don't I don't know. I love this idea. Uh, the, obviously, it's not ideal. You want it to be faster, but it's a software update. It's very clever that they're doing it all um, wirelessly. We talked about how this would be because people were like, "Oh, that you can't do that." It's like, well, Apple makes the device. They absolutely can do that, right? They they have a mode where it's either looking for a specific Wi-Fi or, or it's looking for a very specific NFC attachment, and then it gets on a, a, a you know, a network, or it's looking for a USB attachment, or like, like they built this thing to do this. They built the iPhone and this device to work together to make this happen, which is cool. But you're right. How many iPhones move out the door in a day? 
and how many are you going to be able to do this? And also that means somebody in the retail store is is uh, minding the oven the whole time. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, I, I can imagine a scenario where you might be able to request it or they might be able to ask, right, when you're picking up your device, like, would you like us to make sure this is up yeah. to date for you, that kind of thing. So there's definitely uses for it, but this kind of t- technology would be way better if it was, like, built into the trucks, you know, <laughs> that, that brought the iPhones, sure. you know? So, like, sure, it's, it's, on the it planes. Be, yeah, it could be done. On the ship. Or in the factory, or what? I guess the factory is too soon in the process yeah, it's right before, That's the before they're in the box that yeah this is the that it is whatever that they put on it at the factory is no longer current and so yeah it, it may be for i would imagine that the biggest issue is early on in the shipping right where yeah. they make a lot of them and they're and they're old yeah versions and that they need to get them up to the current version but it's not a, it's not scale i love how clever it is but you're right saying that what's the scale of this and this the the photo uh, that Mac Rumors posted um, shows two of them stacked on top of each other, and it's like, well, you you are already at the point now where, you know, you are like, oh, we'll make it with six. Six will be good, right? And then people mm-hmm. are like, nope, get me more, and I'll just put them in a stack. Mm-hmm. Um, it does look a little like a pizza oven, or I was yes. thinking it's like it's like from Dune, like what's what, what's in the box? iPhones. <laughs> Yes, updates are the strange. mind killer I, okay all right i'll put my iphone in the box it's fine but it's a cool idea i mean this is kind of I one love of the things idea. where like where could they take it you know um and and it is a cool idea like maybe there's something in the future where maybe it doesn't need to do the full update and it takes like five minutes but then the first time that it uh it turned on it completes the update like you just like load in the package on like yeah, this has come from yeah, there have been multiple iphones that have launched now where the software that you need for that phone is not on that phone. And it's not on the phone. And that yeah, is Yeah, and, and you're trying to do a backup from your most recent yep. iPhone, which is already on the new version. And they've they've improved that, right? Where they're like, ah, this is another version. It's, it's newer. Um, would you like me to update my phone, you know, update me to that version and then restore? And you're like, yes. And it does it. It's better. But the goal is that you walk out of the store without having to do a software update. Yep. That's the goal. WWDC has been announced. So WWDC 24, mm. June 10th to 14th, 2024. It happened yeah. uh, in the last couple of I, days. So it's the it. second week of June. Surprise some people. I did go look and see when schools get out here in California, and it is that week, and it never fails that they do it the week that everybody's got, like, end of school things and graduations and stuff. So good job, Apple. You did it again. Uh, people at Apple don't have kids in school. Uh, I, I'm, I'm glad I don't anymore, but it, I laughed. I actually went and looked up my local high school's uh, school calendar, and sure enough, that's their last week because, of course, it is. It's just very funny. I don't know why they do it that way. Um, also, uh, interesting styling on the logo, right? It, it's it's more like triple VDC, mm-hmm. which is interesting. Yeah, I think they did this on some merch last year. I think like the tote mm-hmm. bag had the W styled this way, um, or maybe maybe it didn't. But it's a, it's a fun look. It's a fun look. Uh, you know, Apple is really it's fine. you know it's, it's, it's this is like the admission that WWDC is too long. <laughs> it's like, it's it too is. Long. Um, Shorten it up there. That you, and, know, uh, you, you can know, say it's... worldwide developers conference with as many syllables, uh, which yeah. is always fun. Um, so yeah, it's happening June tenth, fourteenth. Uh, I also That's like it. that Apple have now created a developer page on YouTube where they're going to be uploading the sessions this mm-hmm. year. And so, they got the old old sessions up there. Yeah, from twenty twenty three. So this makes things and, even and, more uh, uh, accessible than they were before. And just to be clear, chances of Mike coming to California for WWDC are low. Yeah, low. I mean, it's def- it's not definitely no right now. I'll know within a couple of weeks if it's okay. like if it's definitely no or maybe. <laughs> That's you where got, I yeah. am right now. You, you got stuff going on. Yeah, I got a lot of things going on, and I'm not. Sh- I'm just not sure if I can squeeze it into the schedule this and year. You, are, y- you already went to the U.S. for uh, Vision Pro. So. <laughs> yeah, already went. Yep, I'll be going back for Podcastathon. Yeah, and uh, it's not like I'm not going to be seeing my friends around that time. It's true. Yeah. It's true. We'll Everyone's coming to me for a in change. July. That's right. Finally. I mean, I've come. I've come to London and more seen than you, most. what three, three or four times now. Yeah, four times. Yeah, more I than think. most. At least, yeah. DMA today. Today. Maybe for the last time. Last time, yeah. As thank you to the hun- literally hundreds of upgradians mm. who wrote in. 
to help us pick a name for our new segment, which will be the combination of all potential regulation, uh, whether it be DMA, right. DOJ, and what will inevitably come. This could have encapsulated Dutch dating apps when we were doing yeah. that for a while. Um, yeah, any 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 legal or regulatory proceedings involving Apple will yes. hear and after have their own segment. Yep, which is going to be called Lawyer Up. Yep. That's going to be the new name. This yep. was by far and away the most su- frequently suggested and also the best one. So thank yes. you to everybody who suggested Lawyer Up. That will uh-huh. be the new name. Uh, we're having some new artwork made, which I'm very excited about, which is Me why too. this segment is still called DMA Today because we don't have the artwork yet, uh, yep. but we will soon. Uh, the I think the second best that I saw was Regulation Roundup. Which I also, also very like. funny, but uh, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to pollute the namespace. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's not all regulation. It's it, like it's better. We, we it's can't better round this everything way. up. You know, you can't if round anything, up. we cannot round this up. The rumors we can round them up. The regulation yes. we cannot round it up. And we just got to lawyer up. That's what we got to do. I had a cool question I wanted to talk about from Francois, who wrote in to say, "I'm curious to know if Apple gets fined a monstrous amount, which could be at least ten percent of their global uh, revenue." Where does the money go? <laughs> Could it make its way to social programs in the EU and their countries? So this is a question where I looked at it and was like, I don't have the answer for this, right? Like, we get a lot of these kinds of questions, which I understand. Like, people ask questions that it's just no way that me or you could know the answer. I think sometimes what people are looking for is our opinion on such a thing. But for me, my opinion is like, yeah, I mean, it probably should. So I started Googling around and I couldn't find it. So I used a tool, this new AI tool that I like called Perplexity. Mm -hmm. Um, I heard about this on the Hard Fork podcast and I've been trying it out. And essentially what perplexity does is it uses various models, and but it, they tune the models to try and make it the best at answering questions specifically. If effectively, better than a Google search is what they're going for. Like that's kind of their idea. And they gave me the following. And I'll put a link in the show notes so people can see what it looks like. Uh, They say the search results that they've done do not explicitly state what the European Commission would do with the money it receives from fines related to the DMA. However, typically, when the European Commission imposes fines, the money collected from these fines goes into the general budget of the European Union. This budget is used to fund various EU programs and activities across member states, which can range from agricultural subsidies to regional development projects, research and innovation programs, and more. So... The idea is, yes, in theory, any money that they would collect from DMA fines would and could go to the European people in some Yeah, form. whatever programs are being done by the EU. Yep. Yeah. So, so interesting questions, interesting thought exercise. Uh, you know, maybe this makes these kinds of things more uh, appealing to EU citizens. I don't know. But... Mm. There's a lot of conversation at the moment about the fines and how they equate to revenue. Um, I don't really want to wade into that (laughs) Uh, right now, but there you go. Thank you for the question, Francois. And hopefully next time we talk about this, it will be Lawyer Up. Nice. This episode is brought to you by SaneBox. Having no emails in your inbox is a thing of the past. In fact, I would call it a dream. A dream? (laughs) Just so you know, could you imagine? We're so inundated with email, it is it is impossible now to respond to everything. And I actually think these days, well, I, it's, I don't think this is uh, unique to me. Most email that you receive is not really for your response. It's, it's stuff that you receive. It's not necessarily personal communication. It's really about just responding to those important messages, those personal communications. They're the things that really matter. And that's where SaneBox comes in. Think of it as like a triage for your email. As messages flow in, SaneBox takes a look at what's there and deals with it for you. It sifts out the important emails in your inbox and directs all the other distracting stuff into your Sane Later folder. So you know what messages to pay attention to now and what stuff you can get to later on. 
I've used Sanebox in the past and I thoroughly recommend it. The ability to be able to have their filtering tools right there. You can have like Sane News, Sane Later. So these are emails that as they reach your inbox, they're automatically filtered into these folders. So they're out of your inbox and you can go check them later on. You can set up custom stuff too. And it really means that your inbox is going to get better trained over time because the system learns from where you're putting the emails into the folders and will be able to just give you the email that you need or the email that you want in your inbox. And you can go out to those folders later on to check what's going on. Sanebox has nifty features like Sane Black Hole, where you can drag messages from annoying senders and you'll never hear from them again, which is such a I great feature. I because sometimes you get email that you can't unsubscribe from. There's no yeah. matter what you want to do. I try and I try. Indeed. I, I try and they still me email me and it's like, okay, you're in the black hole. Goodbye. And they also have sane reminders to ping you if someone hasn't replied to your email by a certain date. Best of all, this really is fantastic. You can use Sanebox with any email client or phone anywhere that you check your email, which is really great. So it follows you around. See how Sanebox can magically remove distractions from your inbox with a two-week free trial. Visit sanebox.com slash upgrade FM to start your free trial and get a $25 credit. That is S-A-N-E-B-O-X dot com slash upgrade FM. Our thanks to Sanebox for their support of this show and Relay FM. Rumor Roundup. Yeah. Mark Berman is reporting that the new iPads that we did our draft on last week will be launching in May. Oh. Production is now being ramped up for these devices. Apparently, they were supposed to launch in March or April, but there has been a delay on both finishing the version of iPadOS that will run on them as well as some production delays from the OLED panels. You know, some people might say, wow, you did that draft prematurely. And I'm going to say no. I actually kind of like this idea that we did a little message in a bottle mm -hmm. from a time when there are fewer details that are that are clear, which is one of the reasons I wanted to do it, is it felt like nobody is entirely sure about all the details, not even Mark Gurman, and that that would allow us to go in and 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 really be uninformed when making our draft choices yep. or only lightly informed. And I liked that. I felt like that was a good competitive, surprising sort of thing. And I honestly don't mind, since we're pretty confident that there's going to be a big iPad release, right? To take a draft and then have it be a message in a bottle, toss it in the draft ocean. Yep. I don't know. This and, would be something uh, that we'll, is... It's like a time capsule. We'll yes. open it up in May. This is something that would be hard to do, like other times but it really did feel that it was specifically ipads coming right and so this was an easier one to do right and and i and i do like that we're that basically this this uh product launch will come and go and would maybe otherwise not have a draft and that would be a shame so yeah considering we did that this last year with one stuff with them right we did this last year with one prospective draft where we Recorded on a Monday, we thought they would announce an event or do a product release on a, like a Tuesday, and I forget what it was. Was it Max? Uh, anyway, Maybe we did it. Was it. The October event, and it worked right. That mm -hmm. we 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 did that, and I like that because otherwise we're missing drafts. So mm -hmm. if we have some sort of confidence that there's going to be a product announcement and uncertainty about what it is, then um, doing a draft in the hopes that it will one day be cashed in. I think is uh, is perfectly fine. So I look, I mean, not that it's all about us. I'm also looking forward to having there be new iPads and I'm sorry that they're not coming sooner, but I look forward to them when they get here. Yeah, it's coming at some point soon. So this next, this next topic, it's not a rumor, uh, but I think is a, a, a conversation, a, a news story that is interesting to people who are interested in rumors. It's Last about week, what powers rumors. It's the, yeah, it's the, it's the, the behind machine. the scenes Con the thing that makes rumors happen, which mm -hmm. is leaks. Yes. Last week, friend of the show, Joe Rossignol at Mac Rumors posted a report about Apple suing a former employee, Austin Aude. I, I've, I've looked this up like yeah. three times, and I think that's how you, I'm going to say it, Aude, for leaking okay. confidential information to the media. This is a quote from Joe. Aude joined Apple as an iOS software engineer in 2016, shortly after graduating college. He worked on optimizing battery performance, making him, quote, privy to information regarding dozens of Apple's most sensitive projects. So I'll just stop there. I have, I have heard and spoken to people in similar kind of career uh, uh, points as Aude yes. was, where they are not necessarily clued in on 
just you know they're not like on that team like they're not on like a like the vision pro team but they are right. at a point in the funnel where they find out about so much stuff because of the thing that they work on so well if, and and how apple is structured right where yeah. where you end up with these functional groups where instead of it just being the people on the ipad team who know about the ipad it's like well the people who work on the chips for the ipad and the graphics for the ipad yeah really like, you could just go through it well they all know about what's happening with the ipad because they had to work on it at least to a certain degree yep it's so like one of the the teams that i imagine is like very powerful at very late stage is the web team at apple right like mm. people building the website so maybe they maybe they don't get like Maybe they get like, oh, you got to be ready for two weeks here, and they don't know right. what it is until that point. But they have all the imagery, all the names, all the price, right. like the stuff are uh, very helpful. Anyway, so there's a lot of these computers kinds of that are not problems. on the internet that are in a locked room that they have to go. Oh, I'm in sure. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. At this point, I mean, after after well, they accidentally put things on their CDN, I yes. think that at this point they probably do. Yeah. The saying about computers, <laughs> and, yes. and what this is, this is the I think. One of the, the weird parts of this. So the lawsuit alleges that Aude used his work-issued iPhone to leak sensitive information mm -hmm. to journalists over a five-year period. This included details about the Vision Pro, the Journal app, as well as policies for product development and regulatory compliance. It appears that most of the leaks were given to two reporters, Aaron Tilley, who works at the Wall Street Journal and was previously at the Information, and another unnamed second reporter who also worked at the Information. A lot of detail and screenshots are actually available in the lawsuit, which Joe went through and wrote about, uh, that relate to are they leaking information about the Journal app specifically. This is like one of the key parts of the complaint. And a quote from Joe, Apple believes that Aude's actions were extensive and purposeful, with Aude allegedly admitting that he leaked information so he could kill products and features with which he took issue. This is why I wanted to talk about this on this show today. Yeah. yeah. Because there have been multiple times in the past where Jason and I have been asked questions or have spoken about, like, where does this why information this come from? Yep. Why do we know about this? Yep. And... We find out about a lot of things, and, and I've, there, I think that there is a consideration that needs to be taken into the provenance of a leak or a rumor. And that, I think, and I think we, we agree on this completely, a lot of the time, people, when you hear something that sounds strange or weird or like really negative, it is someone who is upset about the fact that their pet project was killed or yep. a thing that they care about was killed or a thing that they don't they, like they is lost released. A, uh, they lost they, an argument. They lost right? an argument. And so they want to yeah. put it out there. And you can see like there are these screenshots that are in the article where Alde's referencing, like he says, I can't wait for chaos to break out before Apple corporate people even wake up. So like it's, hmm. he clearly had an ax to grind Yes. And maybe that was why he did this. <laughs> Unfortunately, but it was a company-owned axe that he was that grinding. The, so <laughs> I'll just, I'll, let me just get this last piece out. We can talk about that. Too. Yeah, Apple no, no. found out about the leaks in late 2023, and Aldi was fired. During a meeting about these events during the misconduct process, Aldi denied leaking information and excused himself to use the bathroom. He then deleted what... Uh, quote significant amounts of he then deleted quote significant amounts of evidence from his phone, which Apple knows about and has some access to screenshots and information because he was using his work phone, which is a managed device. So uh -huh. Apple issued these corporate owned phones, but it means that they can. You know, so many businesses do this. Like if you were to quit, they'll cut your phone off, right? And it was just dead. And or they have access to this kind of stuff. And it is really wild that somebody would go to the lengths that Ali went to using the phone that Apple gave him. It's a very, very strange thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, okay. It's, this is sort of amateur hour here. And, yep. and, and that's why he got caught. Um, because lots of people leak stuff to Mark Gurman and they haven't gotten caught so far as we can tell, right? So this is a, this is a leaker who is bad at, at leaking. Um, but I, I want to go back to that, the point about why, why he did it mm -hmm. to kill products and features with which he took issue. And for me, that is, uh, something we should just underline here, which is we don't always do it with every item because I do think that there are various psychologies involved in leaking, but mm -hmm. one of them is trying to affect change. 
And this can be positive or negative. You can view it however you want. But when somebody inside Apple leaks something, sometimes it's because they think it's a mistake. They, they actually think the company is, ma is making a mistake. In a strange way, they think they're helping Apple by doing this. That, that they think Apple maybe has lost its way or like that they right. have, um, they can see something that like their, their bosses can't exactly. see and it's going to hurt the company. Apple, I mean, they think they're helping Apple because they think Apple yes. has made a mistake. Yes. What Apple would say is, we no, we're doing this. <laughs> we decided you're hurting us because you're trying to uh, expose what we're doing to the outside. But I think it's fair to say, and, and, and we see this, um, this is actually not, super different except it's in advance to what we do right where where if we think if we think something apple is going to do or is reported to be doing is bad we'll mm -hmm. say it too and mm -hmm. i have always said you know the goal there is really to get attention on it so that maybe uh it gives somebody on the inside a stronger argument to mm -hmm. say maybe you know look see i told you here's the proof that people agree with me i'm not just shouting into the wilderness here uh, you know we went took this out to the general public and and uh, people are upset about it. But like, there, there's a manipulation thing going on here, and I think that that's interesting, right? It's always, uh, this was the, uh, the example I always like to give is that expensive NBC thing where somebody was like, oh, it's all just going to be network uh, quality content on TV plus. And uh, it was, you know, my pet theory is still that that was a particular producer on a particular show that was actually originally intended to be at a more adult audience and was refigured as a younger audience show. And they were mad and felt like they blamed Apple for it because yeah. they thought that and they extrapolated that to be all of Apple shows, which turns out wasn't true. It was that particular show. So always asking yourself the question as a consumer of, of, of content and of rumors and of all these things is who benefits from this? We should always ask those questions. Who benefits and why are they doing it? Because a lot of times when we cover stuff that's being rumored, um, this is, this starts, it starts to smell like this. I'll put it that way, where you're like, why, do, you know, this is a curious, as you said, kind of curious rumors of like, why, why now? Why this? And the answer is sometimes because somebody is, is uh, unhappy with how it went inside Apple. And now they're going to um, leak that in order to grind that ax. Obviously, I, I don't know this person. I can't get into their head. No. I really don't understand the scenario where they were so mad about the journal app. Like, I don't know what I, it could have been <laughs> that made them know. so mad, you know, that they felt like know. this thing had to be killed. Very I think peculiar. this is a person who is um, who has some very strong opinions and is also, I think, young and, yeah. um, and naive and uh, takes things personally that he shouldn't and and end up has ended up in a world of trouble now for for this but um yeah it's and you can, I don't know. it's kind of inherent like that in the fact that we know about this because we only know about this because Alde is denying a lot of stuff so app and and because of the 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 destruction of evidence apple is unhappy with the amount of information he's provided them about what exactly he leaked and to who so they are now pursuing legal action to try and get more of the full scope. That's why we know about this, because this stuff happens often. Like, I've heard about it before, people that have been leaks and have been terminated, and maybe it's in a similar way to this, where it's done on a device that Apple has some level of access to, that maybe they have, you know, we've heard about the security team, right? Maybe they had, like, a... a a reason to expect that someone was doing something and checked in on them and it turns out they were or they gave them some information that, you know, we've heard about that before, right? Where, like, yeah. they give inf uh, incorrect information to someone and if it gets out, they know who they gave it to. Da -da 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 -da. But this one has gone to court because of all these things that we've mentioned, it's making it worse yeah. and that's where we're well, he, he's They're making an example of him. Yeah, I mean, That's in true. the end, this yep. this comes out publicly. It's because Apple wants people inside Apple to know that Apple does care about this, and that you can get in big trouble and have your career ruined, and and be liable for lots of money. Yep. Um, if you if you are a leaker. Yeah. So I have one other thing. I had a, a comment. It's actually a former employee of Phil Schiller, actually, Michael Gartenberg on Twitter. Um, 
who asked the question, is it ethical for journalists to repost links knowing it's confidential information and the consumer really has no right to know this isn't Watergate or the Pentagon Papers? And here's, here's I, I, I responded to him. Um, here's a version of that, a podcast version of that. So it fits in more than a tweet. So um, talking about like leaks that you get from a source or whatever, is it? Yeah, is it... yeah. And it's like, do, does as a journalist, right. um, if, if you know that they're... Uh, they're passing you confidential information, right? Like, what's the what's the ethics there? And from a journalism standpoint, here is where generally the ethical line is drawn, which is you are not supposed to, and in fact, illegal for you to induce people to give you information that would require them to break the law or their contracts or something like that. So inducement, the idea that you approach somebody at Apple who you know or who you don't know and say, hey, you got any info? You give me the info. I want, I want the info. That is generally considered unethical. If they approach you and say, I have infor information for you, journalist, about what's going on inside Apple, it is considered not unethical mm -hmm. because it's not your job to keep Apple's secrets, right? It's just not. It's their job, and they may be, you know, they're taking their own risk, but they're bringing you information. And in that way, it is Watergate or the Pentagon Papers in the broadest sense of somebody comes, with, comes to you with information, and your job is information about Apple, and you are confident that it's correct. You've checked it, all of those things. I don't really have a problem with it. However, I also, the implicit in this is the idea that this isn't Watergate or the Pentagon Papers, that he's saying it, it, it is it's important. It's not important stuff to the, to the It's not important public. to know what Apple's yeah. doing. People are doing it for entertainment. I think that there's truth in that. And I have always thought that. So uh, the way I put it on on. Twitter, which I, I don't spend a lot of time on, but he asked me directly, and I was like, okay, I'll respond to this. I think the consumer's need to know about the future of tech companies is overstated. Back in the day, when I started in this business, there was a weekly newspaper called Mac Week, and they were often referred to as Mac Leak, because a lot of what they did was, here's what Apple's doing next, here's what other companies are doing next, in advance of them announcing anything. And I always thought that was curious because at Mac user, we never did that. We, all we ever did was follow embargoes, announce things when they were announced. That was it. And in fact, one of the clever things our, our parent company did was keep these technology publications separate so that when Apple got mad at Mac Week, they didn't get mad at Mac user theoretically because we followed the rules and they would talk to us, even though they wouldn't talk to Mac Week for, for in large part because they were reporting on things before they were ready. Um, MacWeek's argument was always, well, our audience is a, it's it's a controlled circulation publication, which means that it's qualified people who read MacWeek. This is in the print days. Had to fill out a card about how many Macs basically they were um, they were in charge of and what buying authority they had. The idea is these were volume buyers of Mac computers and accessories that they they were making buying decisions, and the whole premise was. The people making buying decisions had budgets, and they were trying to plan their budgets and when to buy and when not to buy. Yeah. And advanced information about when Apple was coming out with new products directly impacted their buying decisions. That was the argument. And there's truth in it. I'm sure some tiny percentage of MacWeek's readership were those people. Yeah, but I mean, I can't imagine a publication being able to survive and be profitable purely with just that very specific audience. <laughs> that seems really well, weird to me. I mean, the idea was that the advertisers were, and you got it for free, by the way, the advertisers right. knew they were reaching the people with the money who bought stuff. Sure, sure. And sure. you're advertising the stuff. And like that, that, on one level, it's actually kind of a brilliant, I mean, it's an old business model, but at the time it was kind of brilliant, which is people wanted to get it, but they couldn't get it. But the advertisers knew, even though it was a small audience, it was a super select audience of the people who had the money that, to buy their products in volume, and they really wanted to reach those people. Mm. But, you know, the truth is, and I thought this at the time, I, I remember reading, so Mac, we would come out, I forget what day it was, and we would get them at our offices. Uh, we were down in Foster City in the in the uh, on the peninsula. They were up in San Francisco. They even kept us geographically separate for a very long time. Uh, I remember the new Mac weeks would come in, and this is before the web, or at least before they were on the web. Uh, and I would get the issue, and I remember walking to lunch 
uh, I go get a sandwich across. There was like a big circle uh, pathway with lawn in the middle, and then on the other side of it was like a sandwich shop and a supermarket and stuff. It was the it was a big office tower located in the suburbs. It was really sleepy. There's stuff there now, but not when I was there. Um, and I would I would walk over and I would stand in line at Togo's and I would order my sandwich and they would make my sandwich and they would give me my sandwich and then I would walk back and all the while I'm reading the new issue of Mac Week. It was fun. Even then, what struck me about it was, this is for entertainment, right? Like, this is gossip. This is for entertainment. And while there is a useful quality to it, and there is, even today's rumors have the effect of saying, don't buy a MacBook Air M2 right now. The M3 is coming out, and the M2 will probably go lower in price, right? Look at the, like the like Mac we Rumors buying that. guide, right? That's the exactly. Resistance. People still absolutely. use Absolutely. Don't buy an iPad right now, because in May, there yeah. are going to be new iPads. It's absolutely true. That that is a component of it. But let's also not kid ourselves that a component of it is Apple won't talk about what they're working on. And uh, when when it happens, there's a lot of detail and there's a lot of PR spin. And then we can talk about it then. But it's more fun to have it spread out and to talk about what Apple might be doing in advance. Right? It is. We have a draft. We have these rumor roundup segments. Like, it is more fun. I think it's sometimes interesting because it gives us more space to wonder about why they're doing what they're doing because apple will never say why even when they come out with the product they'll never say why it gives us a little more space a little more time to think about it and i like that i like it it helps me i would i would even maybe make the argument that self-serving though it might be a little bit that it it helps me uh think about all the aspects of the product before the product gets announced so i i can sort of like go on a little journey about like what this product might be and where it fits and all of those things but i think it's also fair to say it is not watergate or the pentagon papers it is in part uh i mean as much as bloomberg will say well and then apple stock changed in the hours after this report when it has no connection whatsoever um i do think it does it, it, it is also about entertainment. So it's fair. It's fair. But at the same time, if somebody, I mean, I'm not in this business, but like mm. if somebody comes to me or, you know, puts an anonymous thing in our feedback form, one of Mike's anonymous informants yep. saying, here's a thing that's going on at Apple, or I get these, I get messages from people who are like, I work at Apple or I worked at Apple and I can explain a little bit of the backstory and that helps inform my understanding of yeah. the thing we're talking about. I can find that, I find that useful. I will accept it. I'm not going to be like, no, no, no. You shouldn't be talking about that, friend. Hands off that information. I don't. I, I the onus is not on me. Like it is their job to know what they can and can't say. And it and and it's it's not. I'm not going to go to them. But if they come and bring it to me, and and I will say this is generally accepted as the difference in journalism. And you can like it or not. Um, you could you could argue like. I, oh, oh I, one other piece about Michael Gartenberg's statement that I thought mm -hmm. was interesting is he said this guy really screwed Apple quite a bit. And this is what I would say to that. I also think Apple dramatically overstates the damage that leaks do. I think leaks do, in 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 like 90% of cases, 99% of cases, do no damage to Apple. None at all. Apple wants to make a splash and have it be a surprise and all of that. But you know what? They seem to be doing okay. And almost every major Apple announcement of the last I don't know, 20 years, 30 years, has been reported in advance. And it hasn't mattered. It doesn't really matter. So uh, although I, so on that level, it's also a game that's being played that doesn't matter. And, and that would be my counter argument to Apple suing the, the guy who absolutely violated his conditions of employment is I don't think Apple really wants to talk about the tangible damage that was done because I don't think there really is any. I, I, I think Apple's doubling down on secrecy about product announcements is just as much about theater and entertainment as the leaks are about theater and entertainment. I would argue neither of them really matters. And while Apple absolutely has the right to roll out their products in the way that they choose, I am dubious that leaking something here and there really makes a difference. So I, I think one of the things that Gartenberg is getting at, which I'm, I'm intrigued what your opinion is on this is like this kid's career is over right and like his maybe his entire professional career especially depending on what the outcome of this um lawsuit yeah. is is there a responsibility from the reporters or is there like should the reporters feel i hate to use this word but guilty in any way about this or is it just like well this is just the way that yeah. it went down no i think uh, i look i think this is a gray area that I think is worth 
considering, which is if you are the reporter on the receiving end of information from somebody and they're your source and you realize what they're doing is kind of, I mean, and you may not know, they may be really cloaked, but there is, there, there is potentially a moment where as the, as the receiver of the information, you have to say, am I protecting my sources or am I going to leave them hang, hung out to dry and know that they're going to burn out, but that's okay. There'll be another one later and this guy's going to be ruined. Um, but that's okay because there'll be another guy tomorrow and I don't care. Uh, like I, I, I wouldn't want to live like that. Right. No. However, how do you tell? I, I think that's the problem is if, if I got a signal from a source, I do this now. I do this now when people send me stuff and I'm like, I'm not going to even, I'm not going to even, I'm going to, I'm going to obscure this a little bit because I think they were a little too specific here. Mm-hmm. I'm going to obscure this a little bit. And I honestly, I think Mark Gurman probably does that too, right? Where he, he, he's obscuring things that maybe he could get away with more specifics, but in doing so, it's actually riskier for his source. Now that's, that's self-serving as well. But I like, think that's I, one of the things that maybe, you know, like we've spoken about the way that Mark started speaking and writing differently. At Bloomberg. At Bloomberg. And maybe that might have been a Bloomberg thing of like, this is yeah. our rules on how you protect your sources. Sure. So so what I would say is I think there is an ethical issue where if you're if you are as a reporter um in a position where you've been given something and you can report it, and it's by a source that you trust. And I don't know how this would come up, but that in doing so you think it's gonna, you know. If, the, if not this time, then sometime soon, it is going to reveal who the source is and they're going to get, you know, fired and sued. Honestly, I think most journalists would be motivated to protect them in the sense that they want to keep getting information from them. But yeah. certainly in terms of just a human being, you know, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to publish information that destroyed somebody's career. Right. Yeah. But how do you know? I mean, yeah. it is also one of the reasons I'm not in that business. Yes. Is that it's a really dangerous game to play. And like, but, and I'm not, I'm but not ha- saying but here how do that, you know? that these reporters didn't do this. But like, you know, I would hope at least they learn now to be like, all right, we're talking a signal, but is this your personal phone or is this your work phone? Oh, f- 100%. Like, I feel if like I were, if you were if establishing I were the information, a long-term relationship with someone, right? Like it's not yeah. just a one-off leak. Surely you do you've the, got to, you do to the have FAQs. a conversation of like, yeah. how are we going to share this information? Da, 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 da. Like, I feel like that there has right. to be like a you are you sh- that is like a, it yeah. feels to me like the effective way in which you protect your source. Certainly, everybody needs to Im- change the FAQ for anonymous sources to say, look, you being on Signal is not enough. Are you no. on Signal on a device not managed by your employer? Like, it's like, f- here's a l- here's some tips now. So you so you've decided to be an informant, <laughs> <laughs> and then like, here are the ways that you don't get caught. Right, that that totally should be part of it. And, and my guess is that the people at the information who don't know who this guy is, pr- presumably or only vaguely know who this guy is, um, I think there's probably an assumption that they know what they're doing, especially since they contacted through Signal and all of that. How would you know that it was a managed device? Um, yeah, but wouldn't. that's why that's why you're right. You you want to start, and for all I know, they do this to some people. Um, they maybe even did it to this guy, and maybe Mark Gurman does this too. But that that whole idea of like, if you've got a good source, one way you can help is to guide them to not getting caught. Which again, I don't think is necessarily unethical because they came to you. But it could be argued, right? Like it's, it could be argued that if you're making them a better list. leaker, yeah, if you're making them a better leaker, like, let me tell you how to really never get caught. I'm not sure that that is ethical or not. Also, but the more that it'll you, happen, because this is the weird gray area, right? And again, we're, there is no judgment on anyone here. Right? We're just talking about this. But the more yeah. that you encourage someone the worse you are making it for them when they inevitably get caught. Right? Yes. And that and that's that's all part of the give and take. A- yeah. And and it, it's one reason that I don't really want to and have never really wanted to be in this this particular business. Yeah. But I think you can do it and be ethical. I really do. I think you can be. I don't think it's fundamentally unethical to report on some businesses' secrets because mm-hmm. they are not national security secrets, as Michael Gartenberg says, but on the other hand, they're not national security secrets, right? Yeah, like yeah. They, both <laughs> That's both of point. those things are true, <laughs> and the, yeah, right? They're, they're not important. They're not, but th- that cuts both ways. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I, it, it is, 
it, it's it's interesting. I would love uh, maybe one day we will chat to Mark Gurman about not about what he's reporting and not about who yeah. his sources are, but about how he handles sources. Because I'm not blaming him or the people of the information. This is hard. And it's it's really tricky, and I think there are ways to do this ethically, and you know I'm I I wonder about that, but but it is there are lots of gray areas too, as you said. So anyway, my my short version of this is, it's this guy's fault. It's not the information's fault. It's Correct. this guy's fault, and uh, the information might be an accomplice or an accessory in a way, but really, if it came over, unless they recruited him like a spy or something, if it came over the transom. And it's not really their job to make sure he's not going to get caught, even though they might help. It's not their job. And and the, while this information, I think, is um, I don't think I don't I don't think it's wrong to publish information like this. Um, and I also question how dangerous it is to Apple and how vital it is to the public interest. I think those are also both true. Like just the sham of it being like important for business planning purposes, not that it, it can be that way, but that mostly it's about just the interest in finding out what Apple's doing next. But also at the same time, I don't think it really causes damage to Apple. Yeah. I just don't, I don't believe that. I don't, fundamentally, Apple will tell you we're doubling down on security, on privacy, you know, we're doubling down on our product announcement security because we want to make it secret and then make it a big stink. Like, I get that that's their PR approach, but I would argue that there is very little difference in most cases between an Apple product launch where we know sort of what's going to happen and an Apple product launch where we don't know what's going to happen mm -hmm. um, in terms of the net effect to Apple, the net benefit to Apple. I, 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 there's a little, yep. but like it's overstated. It's deep. It's just completely overstated. So I have two, two points I want to make to finish this up. One, if you're a journalist listening to this show and you get this kind of information, please make sure that you have a thorough checklist that you're going through with your informants to make sure that they're not going to get caught in this manner too. I know we have a lot of young people that listen to the show. I know we have a lot of young people who listen to the show who work at Apple. Don't do this. It's not worth it. Like this guy's career is over. Like you don't want to be in that scenario. Yeah. Um, don't do it. I know that sometimes it's fun and you want to share things with people. And like what I'll say to you is something that I've experienced, which I think is super great. Like I meet people and they're like, hey, you know that thing? I worked on that thing. It's already out there. Yeah. No one's yeah. going to get in trouble yeah, yeah, yeah. for that. Yeah. All right. Like, no, I, I, that. That's what I was going to say is the people I talk to who are currently working at Apple, mm -hmm. uh, just, to, just to be clear about this, they are incredibly diligent about this. Mm -hmm. I absolutely do hear from them after something comes out where they're like, oh, yeah, yep. I've been... I, I had one that was like literally Vision Pro got announced and like, oh yeah, I've been using that for nine months. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, I have but they won't say because they care. I have care. a bunch of personal friends, like good personal friends who work at Apple. They don't tell me what they work on and I don't ask because I don't and, and want that I, on me. Yeah. And 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 they, they so generally I would say Apple employees are very diligent about yep. this. And when they when I do talk to them about, you know, shop talk, it's generally about, not only is it not about secrets, but it's generally ways that they allow me to be better informed so that I don't make mistakes yes. about what Apple is doing, Same. which is incredibly valuable. Yep. And I appreciate. So they're they're very diligent and generally acting in Apple's best interests. And I, I I'm glad that they feel like they're able to do that, but they are, you know, they are are they're taking care. They're they're not trying to like again, they have the ability to keep secrets. That would be very difficult. Like it, it, it must be painful, right, mm -hmm. to hear a podcaster talking about a thing and you know absolutely everything about it and can't say anything about it. But they do it because they know that those too. are the rules. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just like just send me a note. Like oh, everything you said was wrong. I'm not going to tell you what, but it was all yeah, wrong. Uh, like, oh well, yeah. I'll get them next time. <laughs> oh well, yeah. And if if you're going to use upgradefeedback.com to send us an anonymous information, uh, do it. Don't do it from Apple. <laughs> Don't do it from <laughs> somewhere inside else. the building or no. on or on an Apple device. managed device. Please do not do that. Just don't I do it, you. kids. Please just don't. Yeah. Like I, I, I want you all to have really long, successful careers. Yeah. There, yeah. there, there really true. isn't much worth to it. It's okay. It would not bother me if rumor roundup went away. You know, like I like this segment. I find it fun. But it but never if, will. If the rumors and leaks stopped, I'd also be okay. But it never will. But it never will. It just never. It never will. It never will. The supply chain, at the very least. But it, 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 you know, it just, 
It won't because people are people. And and the same stuff that was feeding Mac the Knife in 1992 is feeding Mark yep. Gurman now. And that's just how it is. It's the not the same people. It's just the same dynamic. I really wish. I genuinely wish Austin O'Day the best because that guy is in a rough shape now. and I, Tough. I feel bad for them. This episode is brought to you by Uni Pizza Ovens. Uni is the world's number one pizza oven company. They let you make restaurant quality pizza in your own home. Let me tell you, like, what about on your own kitchen counter? I have one of those Uni Vault ovens. They're the electric ovens. I'm going to tell you all about their range in a minute. But, like, I take this thing out of the cupboard and I put it on the counter. I plug it in and then I make an incredible pizza at home. I love this thing. I want to use it every single day. I probably shouldn't, but I want to. <laughs> I love the pizza that my Uni Pizza Oven generates. It is also a great time. Me and my wife, we have a great evening making the pizzas the way that we want. We're cooking them. We're taking turns. Like, oh, I'll try this one. You do that one. It's just good fun, and you're making something really tasty. Uni Pizza Ovens, they reach up to 950 degrees Fahrenheit and cook pizza in as little as 60 seconds. That high temperature that an Uni oven can get to is what separates the pizza you'll make here than what you'd make in a conventional oven. They're also super quick to heat up. You'll be ready to go in just 20 minutes, which is enough time to get your toppings ready. Whether you love an authentic wood-fired flavor or cooking with gas or electric, there is an Uni oven that fits your needs and lifestyle. They've, you could also use charcoal. They even have ovens that are like a combination. Like if you want a convenience of gas, but love the flavor of wood-fired cooking, you should check out Uni's Karu line. You can also add an optional gas burner for cooking flexibility there as well. Uni has ovens like the wood pellet-fueled Fire 12 and the multi-fueled Karu 12G. They're made for maximum portability. So if you like cooking on the go, or maybe when you're out camping, you've got it. And of course you have, I think, such a fantastic product and lots of flexibility with the electric Volt 12 pizza oven. It allows you to make pizza indoors and outdoors. Unis are for more than just pizza. You can cook juicy burgers, sizzling fajitas, buffalo wings, and so much more. They have a great app at Uni that have a bunch of recipes in it. You can see kind of like so many things that you can make. It's all really well uh, broken down. You can get all of your accessories from there too. Cast iron cookware, pizza peels, thermometers. You can even get like groceries. So we buy our pizza dough from Uni, but you can get like good cheese and sauces and stuff like that from them too. Uni Pizza Oven start at just $299 with free shipping to the US, UK, and EU. Listeners of this show can get 10% off their purchase of an Uni Pizza Oven. Just go to uni.com, that's O O N I.com, and use the code UPGRADE2024 at checkout. Uni Pizza Ovens are the best way to bring restaurant quality pizza to your home. So go to uni.com, that is O O N I.com, and use the code UPGRADE2024 for 10% off. A thanks to Uni Pizza Ovens for their support of this show and Relay FM. So you wrote an article about immersive, a couple actually, on immersive content uh, on the yep. Vision Pro. Sparked because we finally have more immersive video. So Apple put out a selection of immersive uh -huh. videos when the Vision Pro launched. Uh, there was one about Highwire. There was an Alicia Keys video. There was a dinosaur video. And there was like this sizzle reel video of like lots of different types of things that you could watch in an immersive environment. Right. The, a lot of these things said like episode one. Yeah. But there have been no more episodes in yeah. these shows. No, Apple hasn't released any more immersive content since the launch of Vision Pro. And so then Apple announced that there was going to be a... We knew about this a while ago, actually. It was referenced um, in a press release about... In an MLS, the MLS. Uh, season pass referenced yep. the fact that they were doing a highlight reel in immersive video mm -hmm. for the 2023 Three season. MLS Cup. The MLS yeah. Cup, yes, which is not, which is like, is that a separate thing playoffs. to the season? Like, it's like the no, playoffs? it's the it's the postseason. It's the right. playoffs. Okay, it's the playoffs. Okay, cool. So we knew this, is, and then they announced it was coming. Oh, great! Here it is, going to come out, and then it's we found out it was a five minute highlight package of the MLS yep. season, uh, or of the yeah of the of the playoffs of the of the yeah. playoffs. I'm sorry, the cup, the MLS Cup. Mm -hmm. You ask a bunch of questions in your article that I'd like to talk about with you. First, being why did it take three months to produce a highlight package? Yeah. Which is a great question. More like, than three months to, to, to do a five-minute highlight package. Because yeah. they obviously have had the cameras throughout the entire thing. So, like, you know, is this how long this content takes? Was it not a priority? Know. MLS like, Cup, Cup Final was, like, December 10th or something like that. Yeah. And and they didn't even get it ready for the season opener. Yep. 
Um, so, so what's the holdup? And and then and and why have we not seen any other immersive videos? So the MLS Cup took took a hundred days, and there have been no other releases. Even though we've seen clips in the sizzle reel, none of those have been released yet. Yep. Uh, you and I've heard a couple of who mentioned that the video is just not good. You didn't like, you didn't enjoy it. Yeah. So you know, sometimes you you have to make a judgment and not know and not have talked to anybody else yep. about it and just you got to be out on your own. And that was the case with me when I watched that immersive video. I watched it and I thought, "Oh, this is bad." And I was laughing cuz today uh, I got Stratechery and Ben Thompson wrote about the the sizzle reel and I'm like, "Oh boy, what does Ben think?" And and Ben was like, "This is bad." And I'm like, "Yeah, all right, it's not just me. It's bad. It's bad, Mike. It's it's a bad choice. They yeah, made I watched it too. It, it's it's bad. Um and why is it bad? I think is very instructive. I think it's really instructive. It is edited like a regular video highlight reel. Mm -hmm. It's lots of quick cuts. It's five minutes long, first off. Um, it, lots of quick cuts. It, it it actually shows all of the potential of immersive video and fails at all of it. Yeah. Um, the, the moment that blew me away is there's a moment where you're watching somebody... Uh, move toward the goal with the ball and you, it's like you're on the sideline and you're seeing the artistry of the detailed technical skill of these soccer players that you don't see from far off yeah. it's it's actually harder on tv and so your your eyes are watching the ball maybe and then it cuts to a different angle and you've only been there for a few seconds but it cuts to a different angle and where the ball and the player were is now some dude with a an all access pass standing on the sideline at the uh, you know behind the goal watching the action and i'm like why am i watching this dude so so my point is every time you make a cut you have to reorient and it takes seconds right because now you're in a new place and you got to look around and like you missed the goals in the highlight reel, you miss the goals because they've cut from the side view to the behind the goal view, so which is a better view of the actual goal. But in doing so, you miss the goal because they cut and didn't give you enough time to reorient. And this is the lesson that I'm very grateful that this video was released in this way because it's a lesson that I've learned. I had hoped that they would have learned this while they were working on it, but that didn't happen. That I have learned the lesson, which is immersive video takes time. You yeah. can't quick cut immersive video. The whole idea is immersion. So like, I love that shot behind the goal. I love the shot from the sideline. I love the shot from the field before the game where you're, you're looking at a full stadium and fireworks are going off in the sky. I love the shot of the uh, jacked up uh, supporters in the stands with their wacky signs and, and, they're, and they're shouting. The, the, the big banner up over them, right? That just looks yeah. Fun. Yeah, which is the 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 uh, what is it? The Columbus fans put "Hell is real" on a banner, which is a, there's a whole story about the "Hell is real" sign. You can look it up. Um, it is each individual so shot is like a oh yeah, this is what it's good for. But at no point in the video did I feel like I was at the event. Instead, I was constantly discombobulated. Um, so uh, great for me in that I got to learn about what not to do in immersive video and and great that I have now discovered that other people feel the same way. It's like you but but it squandered the opportunity completely, which is you got to take your time. And the other videos that Apple has released, the the high wire and all that, they they take the time. That's the difference. Is they take the time. And you settle in and now you're there and that's the magic of it. So I don't want uh, a I don't I don't want a highlight reel. I want to be courtside. I want to settle in and feel the excitement and the occasional cut. Of course, the Alicia Keys video is a great example. It cuts occasionally, but if it cut like a music video, it would be unwatchable because the, every time they cut, you're looking at the wrong thing. And then you got to look around and see where everything is. And like part of the glory of immersive video is that you're seated in a spot and you can look around and you can explore what's around you and your surroundings and you become immersed in it. And you can never do that when there's a quick cut. So, so one, it's not very good. Two, why did it take so long? And three, is there nobody at Apple <laughs> who looked at this video and said, oh no, this is bad actually. 
And maybe they did. And maybe the fact is the way it was shot, they can't go back to the MLS Cup playoffs. They can't. They The, the footage they've got is the footage they've got. Maybe there was a technical reason why they couldn't really do something. But I assumed that that MLS Cup final would be a 15-minute long kind of like immersion into the final. And it was actually like two minutes of the five minute video with a bunch of quick cuts. It's like, it's just a mistake. Maybe they were forced into a corner with some technical issues. I don't know, but I don't really want to make excuses for them. Um, and so I don't know what's going on with Apple immersive video. It's a problem, right? They're, they have, they have no content and their latest release suggests a misunderstanding of what it's good at. Like the, the video shows the promise like there are 100%. so many parts of it where i'm like this looks great there's but a the, moment that it takes your breath away and then yeah. it's gone right but the, and the you don't get to, you to don't spend it. time in it yeah and yeah and it's not yeah. you know like there's that sizzle reel which is fun because it's showing the promise of the sizzle reel but i don't need to keep being shown promise right right like i've already seen what football can look like because it was in the sizzle reel they had a yeah. they had a shot right so like i yeah. i don't need this particularly oh like this would be fine if there was already more right like if they had released another 10 videos this would be like okay this one maybe wasn't great but it's cool i got to see well, some fun shots of the football yeah. like that's fine it, it, it still would be broken, and you'd be like, "This is not how you do sports." But we on wouldn't be so video. like we wouldn't be talking about it specifically. I don't think. But I don't we're think desperate be for content, yeah, because there hasn't been any, and this is what they got. So it's that double whammy of they haven't had any content, and then the first thing they release is not good. It's just, I mean, it's funny too because I really expected my reaction to be, "Oh, okay." either dazzled or like, oh, interesting. There are things that work about it and there are things that don't. I did not expect at all to watch five minutes of it and think, oh, this is just bad. Like, just bad. That's a, my, my short review of it is Quick Cuts is the wrong format for this. And while it's not unwatchable, it's not good. It shows everything that's the promise and fails to deliver on all of the promise. It's the, it couldn't have done a better job of delineating what's the promise of sports immersive video and how not to do it. I don't think I am as harsh on it as you or Ben Thompson, but I completely understand where you're coming from, right? That, but like for me, I do see it. It was like, I watched it and was like, this looks good. I am enjoying what I'm seeing, but can see that there is absolutely not enough of it. And it's just the wrong format. And so what, my assumption is the people that put this together, they are used to making that format. Sports two two D, uh, sixteen by nine yeah. HD sports highlight reels. Yeah. That's that. It feels like that. It feels exactly like that. That this is not a demo of immersive video. It's a highlight reel that happens to be an immersive video. And which like, is cause... which is a classic mistake, right? It is yeah. the new medium mistake. It's like yeah. saying, "Hey, television was invented, so let's uh, record stage plays mm -hmm. with television cameras." It's like, no, 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 no. You, That's you not what television break. is for. And like, so to you know, again, like just to to underscore what you were saying at the start, like you're you say you've got like a th three or four second clip, and there's something catches your eye to the left, and you look at it and you want to see what's going on, but then the clip changes. Now, it's gone. if you're if you're watching on something on a screen, that's fine because you're just following along with whatever the director is showing right. you at this moment. And your but field of view encompasses Pro, the entire image, right? Yeah, but in the Vision Pro, you've moved your head, like you're looking yeah. in the wrong direction from what's yeah. happening. Now. Looking at that's that guy standing on the yeah. sidelines instead of the goal, because yeah. that's where the cut has left me. Yeah. But the the when it was good though, like oh, I thought it was real good. Like watching goals in that scenario is fantastic. Seeing yeah. the reactions, like there's the this speed. one where you you see the goalkeeper kind of slam his hands on the ground. You see yes. the guy who just scored looking yes. back at him with a smile on his face. Like this is real good. I need yeah. more of yeah this part. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's the that is the contrast. And that's why I think it's so fascinating is I think mm -hmm. that as a as a package, it, it blows it. But the individual elements yeah. are are amazing. Right. Like it it is strangely a video that makes me desperately want more uh, immersive sports video. 
and at the same time, I think it's a failure. Yeah. And so what 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 does that mean? I mean, it it means they did this one wrong, but boy, this is going to be great when they figure it out. They just they just and I'm a little frustrated that they hadn't figured it out. Like I don't know, I don't know who watched this. And again, I don't know the backstory. I don't know who could watch this and say, no, this is how it should look in immersive video. And again, the backstory may be they had to get it out. They were technical problems. They were very limited in what they could do. It, if it's a choice, it was just desperately the wrong creative choice. But it may be that there are complications here and that they're well aware of the limitations of this and on to the next one. But like the individual moments, like you mentioned the goals, the goals are amazing. The sideline view, the artistry, this is what I always feel about soccer is that, and, and I feel this way about baseball too, is like they reward closer viewing. When you are a, a, an in-depth fan, like I, I think one of the reasons the NFL is popular is that the NFL is great on its surface. It's very exciting. It also rewards closer viewing if you understand how the game is being played at a high level. But if you don't understand it, it's just fun to watch it. Soccer is sort of fun to watch, but if you go into the details, it's amazing. And like pitch, pitching and, and hitting in baseball and the, the confrontation between the pitcher and the catcher, or not the, not the catcher, the pitcher and the catcher are fighting against the batter. And they're trying to, the batter's trying to guess and they're trying to outwit the batter. And if you get, if you dial into that level of the game and can see it, which TV does really well, and it's much harder when you're in the upper deck, baseball can be really magical. Well, soccer, my point here is, unless you're at the event or you're watching real closely or in immersive video, you're right on the sideline, every foot placement, every body move that these soccer players do in order to get advantage on the defender, in order to move the ball into a position where they can put it somewhere else, the passes, the... The, the shots, the just like the more of that you see from close up, it's really amazing, right? And that's in there. It's just so fleeting. And honestly, the fans, I, I'll say it again, the fans, the atmosphere, they, they have the Columbus Stadium, they have the LA Stadium, they have the, the, the stadium in Seattle, um, packed. You're in a stadium. You're on the field in a stadium full of screaming fans. And then you see the fans. Like, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, like, None of it is enough. None of like every shot is individually brilliant, and there's not enough of any of it. Plus, I miss the goals because I'm looking somewhere yep. else, and that's just a mistake. Like you can't, you can't do it. Like I, I had to back, I had to back up, which breaks the immersion, and then like, tra like okay, I need to be looking over here in this shot, even though that's not what I want to look at, so I can see where that uh, the goal scorer is coming from. It's like you just can't, you can't do that. No good. It's no good. But this isn't the only way to watch sports uh, on the Vision Pro. Uh, the MLB app has been updated, and it seems yes. like you were expecting something cool that was not delivered. So, uh, I'm taking a journey here uh, with MLB. I, I've got. I'm going to write a piece about some good things about MLB uh, that I haven't written about. I wrote a couple of pieces about this last week because uh, it was opening day, start of the season. Um, they let the baseballs out. They let the baseballs out of the gate, mm -hmm. and we're on on Friday. We're going to the Giants game unless we get rained out, um, and we'll get to Still watch Giants. the Giants. San Francisco, um, my team. Baseballs be rolled out. That is your team. Let's go, exactly. Jason. Let's go Giants. Let's go, Jason. Let's go, Giants. Let's go yeah, Jason. exactly. Yeah, I was gonna say. It. Yeah, no, let's, go Snell. Let's, let's go Snell. Let's hear it for Snell. Let's go Snell. Yeah, let's go exactly. Snell. Let's go. Um, okay, so uh, by the way, I listened to the talk show. That story about Shohei Yotani, which is the first I'd heard of it. Wild. It's bananas, right? Incredible. It's just. Yeah, and who better to talk about baseball and gambling than than John Gruber? Yeah, uh, incredible. <laughs> so, first off, I'll say the i the iPad app, uh, just my iPad app of the MLB app, just doesn't launch on my Mac anymore. They didn't update, and I heard from a lot of people who say that that's the case. Although I have since also heard from a couple of people who say it doesn't crash on their Mac. I don't know what's going on there. Anyway, so that stinks. But that was just a side note to the Vision Pro app, which since the Vision Pro came out, they've, there's been an MLB app. But all it does is play like game two of the World Series from last fall. It's a demo. It's great. Good idea, actually, to have a demo on there. Mm -hmm. Well, they re they released the official live version for opening day. And it feels very much like it's um, it got rushed out the door for opening day and they weren't ready. So, like, the main window... You know how in Vision Pro you can put a window further away and, and everything... The content is still basically the same size. Yeah. It's just further away in depth. Um, MLB app isn't like that. If you put it further away, it gets really tiny. 
like, what are you doing? Uh, and the control, uh, the l- little closed bar and, 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 and handling bar at the bottom are like, I don't know about the length, but like they're way far below the window, which is weird. It's like, yeah. what's going, it's not like any other one. Um, start a video. There's some selection problems there. I had to get it really close before I could actually like properly select a, a video to stream. It opens a new window with that video, but the main window remains visible, which some apps do. Some apps don't. But I don't need the main window. I've got my video playing. So I do the close on the main window, the close box. The whole thing goes away. You can't close the main window. or The whole thing just quits. Okay, great. So I put the main window somewhere else and I'm watching. And uh, first off, I don't see any game day information, which is this other mode that they put in. Turns out it is there, although I'm not sure it was there on the video I was looking at on day one, but it is there. Um, It's... uh, uh, on the video playing. So to get into game day mode, you have to be watching a video, which means that if you're blacked out on video, you can't watch it. Yep. Um, let me tell you what game day mode is because it's very clever. So it's 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 a, an immersive space, which I don't like. I don't think it needs to be immersive. I, it, it precludes other apps from running along with it, which I don't like. Um, but what you get is you get like a big scoreboard that is the video and of the game playing and a bunch of information like the pitch tracking and a lot of play by play data, lots of data. And then below it is a field. <laughs> well, you have two options. It's the, it's the home plate and the strike zone and every pitch you see the ball come in with the actual tra- trajectory and whether it was a ball or a strike. But the other mode is a field, which I love. And it's the whole field like on my floor and every player is a little disc a little a little circle with their number on it and as the game and, and the ball like you see when the pitch is thrown there's a little streak from the pitcher to the catcher when a ball is hit up in the air you see the ball go up in the air and it marks like the exit velocity and ha- the the apex how high it was at the at the top of the arc and then where it comes down that's all in there pretty awesome um however it would lose players so I would frequently get in a position where, like, the left fielder was just gone. The third baseman was gone. Sometimes the the it would show the base runners. Sometimes it wouldn't show the base runners. The base runners were not a different color. So that was super confusing because you couldn't tell the second baseman from the runner on second base. Um, occasionally, numbers, it would get confused and it never resolved it. So, like, a base runner would run down to first base and be very close to the first baseman, obviously. And then suddenly they would pop. There would just be one circle there. And the... And and one of them had been, I don't know, assimilated and never came back. And you could never see that that base runner again Bye. or that first baseman again. Just buggy. Just super buggy. Um, it's a hard, cool. It feels like a hard thing to do because it requires on, requires the live data and all that kind of stuff. Like I well, can and see they have the live data. They have all the hmm. live data. Hmm. And I don't blame them. Like they're, they're trying to do cutting-edge things, but it's super buggy. And I think it, it struck me that um, that it was really buggy on day one. Um, I don't, for something like the 3D stuff, I don't blame them. That is a brand new technology that they're trying to do. Yep. However, the home window being broken isn't great. The fact that if you close it, your video stops playing is bad. And then you know how I love a quad box, Mike. Um, you can't play Nobody more than one video at a time. Nobody loves quad boxes more than you. No, I love watching more than one thing at a time, right? And you can't do it. You can't say, I want to play this game and then put it over there. And then I want to play this game and I put it over there. It just won't do it first game goes away but come on guys so hopefully they will get up to speed with it but it was a real disappointment on opening day i love their ambition but um but it's it's buggy and kind of broken and it's too bad Mm. um i will say i I do want to throw in a positive note and i will write about this which is the apple tv app got updated to support the quad box they have their own quad box they used to be picture in picture only um and it is in some ways the best quad box implementation I've seen on Apple TV in that it has a lot of clarity. Uh, it, it puts up like what buttons you need to push to change the modes um, so that you don't get lost. Uh, Lauren was telling me how I do the quad box on the Fubo app on Apple TV, but she never does because she doesn't even know because you got to do swipes and click and holds and stuff. And you got to become like an expert at driving that app. Mm-hmm. MLB app puts up a little thing in text that says press this button to get the audio and press this button to bring it to the center. 
and and there's a little strip you swipe down and there's a little strip of games and you like it says click to add or click to remove it's really well done um and something that that tells me about my expectations for software being bad like I, it does what it should and i was surprised by it which is i'm in quad box or or double box or triple box or whatever multi view they call it right and each game you can click to zoom in and on that screen it's got the game day view as an option and game day on the apple tv it like pulls the image back a little bit and it puts like the live pitch data and stuff around it it's it's cool it's a lot of data but if you're a certain kind of nerd it's really awesome and i thought i can't believe i can enter game day from here but i thought I, I bet I'm out of multi-view now. Like, it probably took me out of multi-view. So I press the back button, and the, it, it zooms back out to full screen, and the game day view goes away. And I think, what happens if I press the back button again? And I press the back button, and it zoomed it back out into multi-view. And I thought, huh. Like, that's how it should work, right? And yet I had zero expectation <laughs> that it would do it the right way. I, I figured I had I had silently left into a different mode and I was going to have to exit that and then rebuild my multi-view and all that. No, they built it all. It's really great. My only complaint about multi-view is that there aren't multiple layouts. Uh, if you want to watch four games at once, one of them is big and then there are three on the side that are little, whereas Fubo lets you do the four up where it's literally four screens in a rectangle, one, two, three, four, mm -hmm. um, filling your entire screen. They don't do that, probably in part so that they can put up their little text and like help you use this feature. But I, I would love that. But otherwise, honestly, Apple TV app, pretty great. So thumbs up to them for that. Vision Pro, I love their moxie. I love the, what they're trying. It's broken. It's busted. And I'd also really like the iPad app to launch on my Mac. That would be great. But anyway... Um, I see the potential of MLB has enormous amounts of data, live data about their games. And that 3D field is a is their attempt to display it. And if they can get that right, it will be amazing. Because I was, I literally, Mike, I literally just got and sat down on my floor like I was a kid in kindergarten. Like, let's all get on the floor. But for me, I sat down on the floor. So I was next to my little magic model baseball stadium. And I could watch the little baseballs get hit up into the sky and come down and the little circles ran around and stuff. And I thought, this is, it's, and you can look up at essentially the scoreboard where the video of the game was playing. It was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. There's some potential there. I had a similar experience. Uh, I tried out an app called Vroom for Formula One. This is a beta. I'll put a link in the show notes to a Vimeo video as a test flight link in there. It's actually developed by Chaos Tian who was the person who was convinced the, us the, they, to, they like to disassemble a the, keyboard yeah. and make a, yeah. a touch ID button. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This app requires F1 TV. Uh, if you have F1 TV, which is a paid service, which is mostly available outside of the UK, don't ask. But yes, I was able to use it. And it's amazing. So you can have... You can watch the races. You can have all of the uh, quad box kind of views around the outside of specific drivers. So you can see their onboard cameras, which is the thing you can do in the F1 TV app for Vision OS as well. But this app also has a live track simulation. So you can see where oh. all of the drivers are on the track at all times going around the track. It's incredible. So good. I love it. So good. There have been a few of these kinds of things. I've seen a lot of mock-ups for Vision OS stuff. This is the first app that I've actually been able to use that does it. And uh, F1 need to just do this. They just need to do this. This is really cool. Because they have all the data. F1 is very data-focused. Uh, and I, I use app, an, another app called BoxBox, which gives me a live activity of stuff that's happening. And you can know all the information in real time. It's all API based as well, especially with F1 TV. So you can get access to all of the stuff. So it's very cool. So yeah, there's especially sports with the Vision Pro. There is a lot of promise. We just need to see it realized. <laughs> but we're early days. This episode is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Watching services like Netflix without using ExpressVPN is a little like buying tickets to your favorite artist, but only being able to watch the opening act. If you don't know this, some streaming services have different content libraries for every country, so there are tons of shows available in other countries. 
than the one that you're in. And with a VPN, you can easily access those other libraries. It basically tweaks where services think you are so you can watch the content. Like, for example, we'll take Netflix, right? If you're in the US, you if you're in Canada, sorry, you could watch all of the US office. If you're in Australia, you could watch Rick and Morty. If you're in Turkey, you could watch Lord of the Rings. It is as simple as clicking. Uh, you just open, like you just click the ExpressVPN app. You select where you want to, it to think that you are. You choose that country. You refresh the application you're using, and this content's going to show up. There are so many reasons to choose ExpressVPN. It's blazing fast, so you can stream in HD with zero buffering. It's compatible with all of your devices, phones, laptops, media consoles, smart TVs, and more. They have a service in over 94 different countries, so you can gain access to thousands of new shows. And it works with other streaming services like BBC, iPlayer, YouTube, and many more. Those 94 countries that they have those servers in can open you up to an entire world, literally, of content. I also use this in the inverse. If I'm traveling somewhere else and I want to catch up on a show that I'm watching at home, I would just change my location back to the UK, refresh of ExpressVPN. It's super simple and I can carry on where I am. But it's also great if I know something is somewhere else or if I'm region locked from something. I remember there was something on HBO. HBO made a, a, a West Wing special that was publicly available for free on their website but you can only watch it if you're in the U.S. So I was able to say I was in the U.S., went to the HBO Max website, and was able to watch this West Wing special. Love it. You can stop paying full price for streaming services and only getting access to a fraction of their content. Get your money's worth but at expressvpn.com slash upgrade. Don't forget to go to expressvpn.com slash upgrade and you will get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free and you'll be supporting the show. Our thanks to ExpressVPN for their support of this show and Relay FM. Let's finish out with some Ask Upgrade questions. First comes from Max, who says, Do you think the Walmart M1 MacBook Air deal is the truth behind or the strategy that replaces the rumors from last year that Apple was working on a less expensive laptop? I don't think so. I think, I mean, strategy that replaces, maybe, maybe. but like... The rumors were about supply chain and they were about actually trying to engineer a lower cost MacBook. Um, it's possible. I think it's also entirely possible that what is going on is that Apple is in the long run wanting to have a product in that space and when the M1 MacBook Air can no longer be sold. And can they roll down the M2 into that space or do they really want to create a uh, cheaper to produce laptop the challenge there is any new laptop is not cheaper to produce because it's new and and that's difficult for them so that's why they roll down old models instead so um it might be related but i don't think it's what was motivating those rumors that because the rumors were about engineering a new laptop not about making the m1 go to a different place that's an old laptop yeah i I do. I can imagine a scenario where there were a few things on the like board. One of them was making a new one, but they ended up going with this. <laughs> Which I actually think yeah. this is a pretty good strategy. Like I, I like this heavily discounted MacBook Air thing. I think it makes sense. Yeah, it, I think the question is because also this isn't the end of it, right? That rumor. It's entirely possible that that's a product that even if they decided to go with it, wouldn't be out for another year or two, right? Yeah. It, it's not necessarily that they. Like did a bunch of work and said, "No, let's just sell the M1." Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe, but but my guess is that it was it's a longer term kind of thing than that. But you know, maybe it maybe they put it all together and realized that it didn't make sense and that the best thing to do was just to make uh, keep selling the old laptops for a while at a low price. I've got two questions here. I think they're two okay. sides of the same coin, so I'm reading both. Okay. Lee asks, "Is the Department of Justice case?" actually now in Tim Cook's legacy. Under his tenure, the actions and choices from Apple have led them to these moments of conflict with regulators. So rather than a car or the Vision Pro, is this Tim's legacy? Albert asks, given Apple's handling of the DMA and AI, do you think it's reasonable to consider it is time for Tim Cook to step down? So there's both sides of the same coin. You want me to flip a coin? Is that what's happening now? Are you asking well, me to no, flip I a think coin? That the, well, I think you understand what I'm saying, that both of these questions are of a similar thing of like, is Tim to blame for all of this? Is this yeah. what's going to follow him around? Da, 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 da. Yeah. 
I just wanted to talk about coin flipping. Oh, yeah. No, we don't let you flip coins. You're not allowed to flip coins. <laughs> um, so, all right. Um, to be determined, I, I'm sorry to say it this way, but this is how, how it has to be, is what is the result? If the result is a nothing or an almost nothing, minor changes to Apple's business model that don't actually have major effects on Apple's future, then no. To all. Yeah. If Apple ends up having its business model deeply disrupted in a way that everybody views as being avoidable, which is a question, right? Like it may be that if there's a deep disruption in Apple's business model, we'll look back and say, how would they have satisfied these people? Right. How would they have changed their case? And because it's possible that they all the things we've said, oh, this could have been avoided if you did all these things. It's possible that wouldn't have avoided it, that it was going to happen. They didn't make it better. Right. But it's possible that this was unavoidable. So if it goes badly and Apple ends up being you know, broken up or their business model is invalidated because they have to start building APIs for everything that is integrated with their own products and that makes everything more difficult for them. And as a result, Apple as a business is kind of broken absolutely it's part of tim cook's legacy but the the dare i say the jury's still out there is no jury yet but there may be at a time in the future i think those are the questions history is not yet to be written on this point so it could be his legacy i think um and and is it reasonable to consider if it's time for him to step down well given apple's handling of ai you mean the thing that they haven't announced yet and like it is it reasonable to say that Apple sh should or that Tim Cook should step down because Apple didn't have a large language model out there last year? No, it's not. That's stupid. It's stupid. Yeah. Um, if history is not written, if in five years it turns out that AI completely changed how computing works and Apple never got there because they they were sleeping too long, then yes. Then it's a great question, right? I just don't know. And and so for both of these, I'd say the jury is still out. Right yeah. now, what I would say is that Tim Cook's legacy is that when he took over, Apple was a fraction of the size that it is now. And judged by market valuation and profits and revenue, Tim Cook's legacy is that Apple scaled up from a product, a, a company that had a lot of potential to a company that had all the money. And that if, if I had to guess, that will be his legacy. But the truth is, legacy when? Legacy now? Legacy in five years? Legacy in 20 years, right? Because it's possible from the vantage point of 20 years, we'll say, oh, Tim Cook, yeah, they made a lot of money then, but then they kind of got in trouble and lost their way. Or we might say, oh, Tim Cook, yeah, they made a lot of money and then they went out of business or were regulated out of business. Or we might say, oh, yeah, Tim Cook, he really grew Apple to... A whole new level and then they just kept going from there but we you know in five years and 20 years the legacy is is constantly being recalculated i i i you know but for right now i'd say that uh people right now the judgment would be that he took a business that was smaller and granted had a lot of the pieces ready to go right people like oh, well steve jobs got, got all that ready it's like he did get it all ready but tim cook's the one who took the all that stuff that he inherited from Steve Jobs and presided over this enormous expansion of Apple size and uh, profitability and revenue generation. Um, so it all, I, I, sorry to not give a straight answer to this question. No, I, I think this is, I actually think you've given, I think the perf the only right answer, which is that like at this point for both of these things, and the reason I brought these things, we've, I've had a few, we've had a few questions like this. It is too soon to suggest that either of these things were a mistake. Like, right. currently, all of the things that have led to the DMA and the DOJ, they were a scenario of the exact right thing to do because Apple is massive. Massive. And it makes so much money. And you it can make a very good argument that Tim Cook did exactly what he was supposed to do, which was make the most money possible. Yeah, and grow the company and yeah. grow the stock price and all and the grow the valuation and all those things. And it may be yet that the DMA or something again, the DMA and and uh and the US regulations like could break Apple. I think the most likely scenario is Apple af after protesting that a lot of the changes that are wanted are 
anathema to Apple's entire business model and its its credo of protecting its customers. Um, and, and we all say that it is actually because Apple wants to make more money, that the concessions Apple has to make to satisfy everybody are so limited that while Apple makes a little less money, they've already made that up in growth mm -hmm. and that no major changes to their business model are instituted and they keep on going, right? Like, yep. I think that that's actually the most likely scenario is that what changes is minor. Um, but, you know, if I worked at Apple, I would be really worried about the risk that the changes are going to be major and it's going to break our business. I yeah. would be. Yeah. But I, I'm, I'm, and I'm trying not to be cynical here, but like, I suspect that the way this will work is Apple will give in on things that turns out don't actually matter as much as Apple says they do, but they want a posture that they do so that it, they, they can be pained when they do it so that it makes, you know, it limits the scope. And that in other cases, they basically deal with a U.S. system that is generally favoring big U.S. companies anyway so they can get away with even less so you know i think that's the most most likely scenario in which case tim cook's entire approach would be more or less vindicated mm -hmm. uh so but but it's too early for us to say i i, I certainly don't if, if they get if they get really 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 shafted by the eu or by the united states um and it breaks their business then it absolutely would be reasonable to say tim cook has to leave right because they're going to need to show some resignations and say we're changing our entire approach because you're right and we're chastened and we're going to be a different company now but um boy we're a f we're a long way from that i don't think we're going to get that i i don't, I don't there, think so. there is a scenario I think it's highly unlikely it, yes there is a scenario in which one of these things could be so horrifically bad that like really the only smart thing to do from a PR perspective is to have a new CEO. Yes, that could happen. I do not think that's going to happen. I, I just don't. I don't think that compliance with the DMA or with the Department of Justice case, I don't even think it would massively impact the company. Like, I think you would end up with a scenario where it's put to the test what we're saying is has been the case forever which is people just want to buy iPhones and use their iPhones yeah. and that complying with all of this stuff doesn't really make a material difference because people just want to use their iPhones. Earlier in this podcast we talked about how Apple I think overstates the value of secrecy yep. in product announcements. I think Apple overstates the importance of lots of stuff and they do it strategically and this is a case where i think apple has dramatically overstated not that it isn't true but that it, they overstate the impact of all sorts of things like what the eu is trying to do what the ec is trying to do and what the us alleges that i think they've actually behind the scenes they've got a lot of stuff that they're willing to give on and they know it's not going to make an impact or it's going to make a minor impact there, you know, losing a little control, losing a little power is not necessarily something that ever shows up on a balance sheet. Losing a little money does, and they're, it's going to hurt because Apple is a public company and, and they might make a little less money and that there are people at Apple who have a very strong incentive to prevent that from happening. But I, as an outside observer, can say even that doesn't really matter. If the spigot's still on, it's just flowing a little bit less, and it means you are a little less enormously profitable and a little less enormously valuable. Like, I have a hard time envisioning scenarios, doesn't mean they can't happen, but like the best case scenario, or the, the most likely scenario is that Apple gives up a little power, gives up a little control, but not as much as you think, and gives up a little bit of revenue in, in competing with others, uh, and it doesn't really matter. And that they just continue steaming forward because they're so huge and so profitable that in the end it doesn't matter. And I, you know, if I had to predict, that's my prediction: is that is that this is not going to be the thing that that stops Apple. Now, something else might stop Apple. Like the lesson of the of uh, the Microsoft case is that it turns out that it was all kind of a waste of time in some ways because the next generation of stuff uh, kind of rendered it irrelevant. And we can argue that point. Were they distracted? Is that why they missed on mobile? You know, the, the opening up the web allowed cross-platform to be better and that wouldn't have happened if IE was was unconstrained. Okay, we can argue it. But like, 
my bigger point remains, which is what Apple's afraid of and Google and every other tech giant is missing the boat on the next big thing. That's that's the the existential risk for Apple, I think, is not being regulated. I think they're going to still have lots of money. Right. I think it's if it, like I said, if AI, it turns out, makes devices essentially irrelevant and device and apps and operating systems irrelevant because everything's going to be running on machine learning and we're just going to talk or tap or whatever to a model that's going to do what we want that that could potentially eliminate a huge amount of apple's uniqueness in the market and therefore destroy their their business model that's a real existential threat but i i, I just i don't i think it would be I think it's unlikely that that regulatory scrutiny is going to blow up Apple's business. It could happen, but I, I don't. I don't think it will. But we'll be tracking it the whole way through. Sure, in of course lawyer we will. up. Sure, exactly. Send us your anonymous secret. Nope, don't. <laughs> well, you can if you like, but we're not going to induce you to do it. Just be careful how you do it, and be careful. Don't be use careful. a company managed device. Whatever you do. You can send us in that feedback or any mm. questions you have for our various segments over at UpgradeFeedback.com. You can check out Jason's writing at SixColors.com. You can hear his podcast at TheIncomparable.com and here on Relay FM, you can where you can listen to me, too, and check out my work at CortexBrand.com. If you want to find us on social media, Jason is at J Snell, J S N E W L. -L. I am at iMike, I M Y K E. You can watch video clips of this show on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube. We're at Upgrade Relay on there. Thank you to our members who support us of Upgrade Plus. You can get longer ad free versions of the show at getupgradeplus.com. Thank you to our sponsors of this week's episode ExpressVPN, Uni, and Sanebox. And thank you for listening. I'll be back next week, Jason. We'll be on vacation and I'll be having a guest host. Until right. the next time we speak to you, Jason, say mm. goodbye. Bye, everybody. Looking forward to that eclipse. See you all in two weeks.